Hi, I'm Greg G0 DEB, Technical Team Leader for Raynet, and this is a re-recording of a presentation that was originally made in November 2020 uh, to Zone 10 and under the auspices of the technical team to the rest of Raynet UK nationally about the Raynet UK DMR server that was being developed. What I want to cover in this video is an introduction to the DMR networks in the UK and why DMR is the network we've chosen to focus on and then why we needed a separate Raynet UK server to meet our needs going forwards. So first of all, why digital voice? Well, digital modes add some interesting possibilities as the screen shows. If you have an analog channel, then you have a single conversation or a single communications channel every 12 and a half kilohertz, and you need a single repeater for each channel if you're running anything like a talk through. When life gets a little more congested, then DMR, or as it was previously known, Moto Turbo for Motorola, its original inventors, uh, splits the 12 and a half kilohertz channel by time division multiple access. So that same 12 and a half kilohertz channel is split in time between slot one and slot two, and each user and each conversation adopts a different slot. So you can get twice the capacity through the repeater. A single repeater or talk through unit would do the work of two, and it reduces the amount of combining equipment needed and the amount of engineering to make a dual talk through system actually happen, which would be very difficult in Raynet terms to manage and in the analog space on two meters and 70 centimeters. It also was seen to bring some potential readability improvements going to digital. Normally the graph shown shows a digital cliff edge where analog fails gracefully as the signal strength goes from strong to weak, but the digital system keeps on going and going until it fails. Life isn't always quite that easy and the cursor that should be seen at the moment, if you hover around the excellent area here on the audio quality, you'll see analog is actually seen by some as better than digital um, in terms of its audio quality and strong signals. But as things degrade, the digital audio quality also degrades, but at a much slower rate than analog. So you do get a potential increase in coverage area because the digital system can keep on going where analog might have got below what an untrained listener can aim for. Remember again that DMR is a commercial system and was aimed at commercial users, not radio amateurs who are used to digging weak signals out of the noise. So again, analog will keep going a little bit longer than the digital system where the computers can no longer cope. And this is something we have seen before with APRS where received wisdom from the APRS community is that you do not get the same range on APRS um, analog, sorry, digital networks compared to analog voice because the computer needs to apply some intelligence to doing the decoding, whereas the human brain can fill in gaps in audio a lot better. But notwithstanding, digital is seen to provide some readability improvements in some areas. But having got such a wonderful digital idea, there's lots of people trying to exploit it. In the amateur space, we started off with DSTAR, a amateur-only protocol developed by the Japanese Amateur Radio League, and Yesu uh, decided to set up Yesu System Fusion, variously known as Fusion YSF or C4FM. DMR, Digital Mobile Radio, is a commercial standard and has mostly taken over digital radio um, in the commercial space, but there's also Tetra, which is used by Airwave, M17 listed here is an amateur only mode, which has some benefits because it's not being written within North America, which I'll come to in the next slide. FreeDV is a digital voice mode, but which started off its life aiming at weak signal HF operations or poor signal HF operations. And finally, APCO P25 from the Association of Public Safety Communications Officers, 
um, is an American system whose benefit was principally that you could run digital systems over existing analog repeaters and didn't need to rebuild your repeater networks. So there were many, many potential digital voice modes available to choose from. But why DMR? Well, those amateur modes like D-Star are generally developed with the American market in mind and American license conditions block any kind of encryption. In the radio regulations by the International Telecommunications Union, it's quite correct that encryption between countries is forbidden in the amateur service, but the amateur satellite service is allowed encryption internationally for the control of satellites. When it gets to your local regulations and your local regulator, Ofcom have made clear in the license that radio amateurs are allowed to encrypt on demand of a user service where the information requires it. Now those amateur modes developed with the American market in mind, like DSTAR and like YSF, don't support any kind of encryption. M17 as a relatively new digital mode over the last couple of years is written outside North America and will support encryption but it has no hardware base at the moment. It is a modulation scheme principally driven through small computers from what I can see. Uh, hardware still to follow. But those commercial radios like the DMR radios do support encryption and are available freely on the surplus market and DMR started to take off as an amateur mode because of the work of the Motorola Amateur Radio Club and their DMR networks using repurposed Motorola equipment. When we did the technical survey about five years ago to see what groups were using for their technology, we could see from the responses uh, that DMR had a larger installed base than the other modes. So, albeit 27 groups answered out of the 100 that were actually polled on the uh, survey, but reflecting five years ago, DMR still had half the um, available users able to use it, whereas D-Star and Fusion were falling a little bit further behind. So to select a mode for Raynet going forward to um, start experimenting with and see what the possibilities were, then DMR did seem to tick all the boxes that it had already a small user base and would meet our user services needs. So how did this grow from those inputs from the Motorola and Amateur Radio Club? Well, there are now many more networks in the UK than you may think. Brandmeister, Phoenix, DMR Plus, DV Scotland, regionalised clusters of DMR repeaters like the Salop cluster and the Southwest cluster, and probably more, and indeed many more. Recently, Free DMR set itself as another national stroke international DMR network linking repeaters together. So there's many, many networks and to, try to negotiate a single access for Raynet across all those groups with all their different policies was going to be a mountain of a task to try and achieve. But we would have needed to achieve that because as you can see from the map shown here, each of the different icons on the map for the UK show the different networks or different type of networks. You can see there are areas where population is low and there are no DMR repeater coverage uh, points whatsoever. But in other areas, you can see that there's maybe a preponderance of more symbols than another. So this is the case that Brandmeister is probably fairly evenly spread across the UK. But Phoenix was very much the principal system in, say, Northern Ireland and in a swathe of the south of the country uh, before it hit the regionalised clusters like the Southwest Cluster and finding Brandmeister access would be difficult there. But each of these networks was linked to the internet and they did actually start to link to each other. But each network has its own ideas of what services should be hosted and where they should be serviced and how they should be accessed 
and it is a feature of amateur radio that politics and opinions means that people can set up what they want and where they want it and how they want to do it. So some of those networks would gather users together by talk groups based on special interests or would set rules up saying that a traffic on time slot one was intended for local traffic only and time slot two was for out of area or DX traffic and another network would do exactly the opposite. So linking them together is possible through bridges, but we are having to be aware of what the different policies are in each network that gets connected to. So we asked for a talk group on the Brandmeister network as being the principal network that gave the best chance of coverage uh, for members around the country. It was also the easiest one for members to get access to via hotspots using the Pi Star software that was available to make a Raspberry Pi and a simple hat into a 70 centimeter access point onto the internet and into the Brandmeister network. That took many months to achieve and luckily by negotiation between the systems owners at the time uh, Brandmeister then linked talk group 23531 to the Phoenix network. So now we were more like covering 80 or 90% of the repeaters within the UK. And then the Yesu System Fusion Room is set up, hosted by Rainet itself with the same number. So 23531 became the, if you like, the well-known talk group or the well-known access point number for Raynet in the digital DMR systems and YSF systems. But the questions start to get asked quite rightly. Isn't this inappropriate for Raynet? And I did say a few slides ago, all these networks are linked together by the internet. And note I said the internet as if it is something different here. The International Telecommunications Union has a recommendation for the amateur service uh, 1042, the application of amateur and amateur satellite services to disaster and emergency communications encourages us to develop robust, flexible and independent amateur services. Independent, that is, of other utilities, of power networks, we should not fall over just because we run out of power or the internet falls over. But we can be independent. And on a trip to Friedrichshafen in 2009, our partners in the German Amateur Radio Club and their emergency communications group were demonstrating this unit, which is a small hotspot. That's the Raspberry Pi in the top deck of the picture, which was then linking down to Microtech routers. The HAP lights are small routers, roughly 60 pounds each, I think at the moment, but they will provide mesh networking. So what the Germans had in this very small unit was a 12 volt powered set of hubs and hot, a Raspberry Pi and a UHF hotspot, which would link itself in a 2.4 and 5 gigahertz mesh arrangement out to other similar units so they could use their DMR handhelds as the terminal in their pocket or in their hand to link back through their own created internet using mesh networking. And the lower Microtik um, router there linked out to more conventional dishes that you're more used to thinking of for wider area mesh networking. And a topic maybe of another video might be how mesh networking isn't just for providing wide area networks, how it might have some value to us in the local area as well. But this was a bit of a clue that we could set up a simple Raspberry Pi running open source software at the time. It was called HB Link, now HB Link 3, which would run and provide a DMR server. But how did we start to get people together? Because that single talk group we had was unlikely to be enough for Raynet use. We were aware of 
group activities uh, early on before this all before the pandemic and before the DMR server for Raynet started to get developed and thought of where other amateurs were not exactly happy that a whole repeater or repeater cluster being taken up by um, Raynet activities tying up one slot. It's also noted that in some areas, repeater, some repeater keepers, it has to be say a small minority, are not exactly Raynet friendly and would actively block um, repeater usage for, by Raynet because it's their repeater after all, it's their notice of variation. However, um, we have another issue with repeater keepers that they have to keep a wider community happy than more than just Raynet. So they have to fi find a balance, and this is how the different DMR networks were set up. Some focusing more on local traffic, some looking at more international. And again, when you start to bring networks together with lots of users, you do get lots of conflict about what people want to hear. And the repeater keepers have to keep the peace and ensure that as many users are kept happy as possible. And that German concept, well, HB Link isn't exactly scalable. It's great for their method of deployment, which is to create a mesh network in a small area for an incident. But they've got much better links with their local groups and better standardization. So it has been easier for them to roll DMR out around the country as a concept. Whereas we did not have many members apparently interested in digital voice. So how could we harness all this and make that single talk group work for us well? Well, it's a virtuous circle by having 23531 on the Brandmeister and then Phoenix systems linked, we could set up an activity period. And once we started to get users interested and in the middle of the pandemic period of 2020, we probably only had 20 members actually showing any interest in the weekly activity periods that were being held on 23531. But what did we do outside that? Well, if you have a dedicated Raynet server, you have control of your own talk group numbering. You can take yourself away from the public repeaters via hotspots and do experiments and tests and maybe have more group level chats. And um, that builds the community and the sense of community. And as you'll see when we get to the last slide, the number of users active on the server or on digital voice modes now seen is nearly 10% of Raynet membership, which is a massive growth from the 1% that uh, we had less than 12 months ago. By having that dedicated Raynet server and its own talk groups, it's also allowed us to take ourselves away from some of those um, issues with the public networks, as I'll call them, for the general amateur community. Because uh, it is within the rights of the different network operators to decide to renumber and reorganize their talk group structures to meet the user's needs. And there was a threat that 23531 could have disappeared and been taken off as at one point, even though it had only been allocated two months before, because there had been a decision to restructure. If we set our own talk group structure early, we can do it in a way that allows groups to set up their own servers and still interoperate. We would not have clashes of numbers and talk group numbers and all sorts of other procedural issues if we used 23531 on Brandmeister of Phoenix to develop the user base, a dedicated Raynet server to provide a more Raynet friendly playpen and to set the structure within which local groups could then run servers locally on their own events using that same model maybe as the German networks do, which could bridge into the national server or could run totally standalone if necessary, um, providing that truly independent communications that the ITU wishes to have as the amateur service. So the numbering scheme is something that uh, we decided to set up in a way that would allow for lots of experimentation later. So within the PiStar hotspots, the leading digit is used to describe which network you want your digital voice traffic to be sent to. 
normally things will go to Brandmeister, but if you prefix it with a seven, then you might go into the into the YSF networks. If you prefix with an eight, you'll go into the Phoenix network. And the number that seems to be free, uh, and therefore we've stolen it, is the figure five. So all the Raynet UK server numbering schemes will start with figure five. The next digit is a service identifier. So five zero is for DMR voice. But data over DMR is something that is used by our Romanian colleagues because you can adapt Motorola radios and I'm looking at some of the simpler DMR modules to do 4,800 board data over UHF using the DMR protocol. So you want to keep that data traffic separate from voice traffic. So having 5-1 for data over DMR is the next use of that steering digit. And the digit two is currently reserved for voice over internet protocol because uh, it was asked for many years ago, a centralized numbering scheme for voice over internet for those groups trying mesh networking at 2.4 and five gigahertz where you can run an asterisk telephone exchange. Again, we need to be careful about how you avoid clashes between numbering. Asterisk out of the box allows four digit extensions, but if everybody uses the same four digit extensions, then bringing systems together will lead to conflict. The use of the standard UK subscriber trunk dialing or STD codes would also potentially lead to conflict and confusion because is the 01244 number you are dialing a real public switch telephone network number or is it a hidden private number on Raynet's own VOIP system? So by having the steering digit two for VOIP extensions, again, we can use the same numbering scheme and it would become clear what the number is being aimed at. The other advantage of having this as a common numbering scheme is that one day we can look at maybe tying together voice over internet telephone to DMR voice channels because Teleradio Connects are a feature of commercially deployed DMR installations. So how to make it unique for the groups? Well, the next three digits is the group code for the local group, county or zone concerned. So 50312 would be a DMR voice number for West Cheshire. 50846 would be a DMR voice number for Merseyside County as a whole. Notwithstanding, Merseyside has got Wirral Group and Liverpool Group and other groups underneath it. So we could build in a massive amount of redundancy into the numbering scheme. We've gone from having one talk group for the whole country to having thousands of them. Because we finish off the numbering scheme with two digits so that you can have locally assigned talk groups 0 to 99 or locally assigned data over DMR groups 0 to 99 or locally assigned VOIP extensions 0 to 99. And again, if anybody wants to query having only 99 telephone extensions, Remember, we're doing this on a network potentially that doesn't have a lot of capacity and nobody has a good traffic analysis of how many telephone calls you could support on the smaller Raspberry Pi asterisk installations that are being rolled out in our mesh networks. So it's been kept a little real as well. So what does the system look like today? Well, you have a multitude of ways of accessing it. So at your house level, if you have a Pi Star hotspot in your house, then dialing 5023531 going through the Pi Star hotspot will come out into the Raynet UK DMR server, which will um, then be relayed to everybody else connected to that talk group. That will also be relayed out to our YSF server which can be accessed by people with system fusion hotspots on hash 23531 or fusion repeaters on 23531. We have a link from our server cloud across to Brandmeister. And Brandmeister you could even get into directly if you so choose just by dialing 23531 and you get into that cloud. And 23531 on a public repeater, same idea. 
and so on for the Phoenix network, which bridges through DMR plus from what we understand. Same again, you could dial up 23531 with the appropriate prefix for Phoenix, depending on your programming, into your hotspot or go in through the public repeaters and go into Phoenix and it would go through all these bridging links until your traffic would reach everybody listening on the National Raynet UK talk group. This looks easy, it is not. There are many links here that can be broken and the best system, the system you can trust the most is the one you maintain. If something goes wrong in the Phoenix system or between the bridge between Brandmeister and Phoenix, Raynet UK has no control over it. So we are encouraging people, if they can, to set up hotspots, to experiment, to get the full advantage of having all the five zero talk groups that are available to them through the Raynet UK DMR server, rather than just being limited to the single 23531 on the public networks. But they're all there because we also have to recognise that in some areas you cannot take hotspots. It may not be appropriate or practicable for you to do so. But being able to call up on a public repeater and see if you can get an answer from anybody else in Raynet if you require some assistance is a facility still very much worth having. So it's very much a developing system. Um, over the last few months of testing, there have been many learning experiences. Nothing ever fails, we've just learned from it. For example, somebody doing an innocent click of the push to talk on their radio at one side of that cloud might only be a half second burst of transmission. But with every bridge that that RF gets passed over to get between the networks, then that half second grows to being a one second, one and a half second, two second blip before it reaches, say, the rain at UK server from Phoenix. That two seconds doesn't seem like a lot, but the digital systems do have some delays in them themselves. The matter of speaking means that your analog voice is turned into a digital data stream by the chips inside your handheld radio which is then trans which takes a finite time, is then transmitted to the repeater or the hotspot, which then further slices it and redirects it to go into the servers internationally or for the Rain at UK server nationally. And then that decoding of digital to analog happens in reverse. So it is not unusual if you have two people with digital radios standing next to each other talking through a repeater to hear a one or two second delay and if you have a one or two second little blip appear while you're waiting for a delay to pass by, then you might think that's somebody breaking in. And it may not be. It was just an innocent little press of the push to talk to see if something was working. You have to wait a further two or three seconds to be sure the channel is actually clear before you can transmit again. So participants in the DMR networks are used to the idea of counting to at least five before pressing the push to talk and responding to ensure that the doubling that may occur with all these different networks coming together doesn't become unmanageable. We also have the issue of some people drinking from a fire hose. Having given thousands of talk groups on the Raynet UK server to some of our members, we did observe that some people did turn them all on at once. So a hotspot was monitoring many, many, many talk groups as a static talk group. And a static talk group is one which is on your hotspot all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If any traffic appears on that talk group, it is broadcast by your hotspot locally. This is different from a dynamic talk group where after 15 minutes of a transmission on a public dynamic talk group on a repeater, then the repeater will drop that talk group. You will hear nothing further from it if there has been no local activity within the last, say, 15 minutes. But if you have too many talk groups as static and active all at once, then you have the problem that a conversation you might have been cheerfully having with somebody on the Cheshire local group is suddenly overwhelmed by other traffic that's coming in for the national talk group. 
and because they're both prioritised as static on your hotspot, whoever gets there first is what you hear, and that will break a conversation. And it's that kind of timing issue that is something that's still a feature of the Sunday afternoon activity periods at four o'clock on 23531 and 502331 in understanding that people come into the network from different locations and may have both the Raynet UK and Brandmeister talk groups active as static on their hotspots. And then confusion occurs with how is it I am switching from one talk group to another? And it's whoever was there first. But these are all things we're learning from and there's now growing a much larger community within Raynet who are understanding these issues and learning how to translate them into things we would need to know for true Raynet emergency use in the field. What I do have to say is that this absolutely does not replace analogue. The technology survey of five years ago showed there were still many areas where two metres FM still met the user services needs. And that will always be the case. And digital is not necessarily going to take over the entirety of Raynet operations, not for many, many decades probably to come. We are Raynet because we have a wide range of tools in the toolbox and can use any of them as appropriate from HF data, HF voice, Morse code, two meters FM, digital modes, everything remains in the toolbox. But within that spread, there were groups who wanted or needed direction in what to do to drive their digital voice investments and training. And the current plan is hoped to provide a framework for those groups who want to do more and help them to link together nationally. Because if you have a group with only two people interested in digital out of, say, 20, that's probably a very lonely place to be. But by providing the Raynet UK server, we've provided a place for those of a like mind and interest to experiment outside their groups and help grow this service. And to end with this point of growth, less than 12 months after the Raynet UK server was set up and indeed getting talk group 23531 allocated on Brandmeister, we've gone from a handful of stations uh, to nearly over 169 stations on the Raynet UK server and over 260 member call signs heard across all the DV networks. So that's a massive growth and is well over the 10% of the uh, 1,700 members approximately in Raynet at the time of recording this in May 2021. So that growth has in no, has in no small order been facilitated by the activities of everybody in testing, playing and enjoying themselves and practicing with servers and trying all sorts of other methods to access this and shows that we are in, our interest is in keeping this going and in trying out new technologies which might be of advantage to us in emergencies going forward. So with that, thank you very much for your attention. If you uh, like the Raynet UK YouTube channel, then please do hit like and subscribe to the channel. More videos will be forthcoming, reflecting all the range of activities that Raynet members will be getting involved with.